Hello and welcome to our online service for this the third Sunday after Trinity. Um, for a couple of years now our online service is comprised of uh, some recorded, sometimes live, sometimes recorded separately, uh, key moments from our morning services. Usually the, one of the readings, the sermon, the prayers of intercession and a hymn. The number of people viewing these uh, videos that we put up each week um, is, is relatively small uh, these days, uh, 20 to 30 at the most, sometimes uh, 10 to 20. Uh, and of those people watching it, actually the statistics show us that less than half of those are actually watching the video all the way through. Um, and this is relatively low numbers for the amount of effort involved in putting the services online. Uh, in discussing with the ministry team uh, how we should carry on, uh, our feeling is that the main part of the service that people are logging on for is the sermon. Uh, and so our thoughts were that going forward we would make life easier for uh, all the people involved um, by just putting the sermon up online each week. Now, uh, I know that some of the people who watch this, uh, because they've told me, uh, do value the, the whole experience, that they like having the prayers and the hymn as well and, and the, the reading too. Um, but um, that's an even smaller number than the number who actually watch each week. So um, if you feel strongly about this, if you, if you strongly feel that you would like us to carry on putting, uh, particularly the prayers actually, they're, they're, they're the bit that are, uh, are quite difficult to record sometimes. Um, if, you, if you feel that you want uh, a more expansive service each week online, um, then, then let us know. Uh, you know. Get in touch with me, uh, something in writing, an email or something. Uh, so we've got just some idea because um, we don't, for the most part, we don't know who, who it is who's watching and what part of the service it is that they value. Um, I'm saying this today in particular because um, I know that we're not going to be able to record the, the prayers this week. Uh, the person who's doing them in church uh, is, has started doing it fairly new. They, they don't have the ability to record themselves. Uh, in the past, I've recorded them, but I'm in Albury tomorrow. And since Andrew retired last week, I'm going to be increasingly out and about across the benefits. And I, I do quite a lot of the recording myself. So um, uh, this week uh, you're going to get a reading uh, and the sermon uh, and, and that's probably how we'll continue for the time being um, unless we get a really strong uh, sense that there's a lot of people out there who would like, who would like us to continue doing something more. Um, so please do, please do let me know if that's you. I'm going to give you uh, our reading for today from Mark's Gospel now and, uh, and then Mike uh, is going to record uh, his sermon uh, from this morning uh, and uh, and then you'll have that to listen to as well. Thank you. So the gospel comes from Mark chapter 4 beginning at the 26th verse. Jesus said the kingdom of God is if someone would scatter seed on the ground and would sleep and rise night and day and the seed would sprout and grow. He does not know how. The earth produces of itself, first the stalk and then the head, then the full grain in the head. But when the grain is ripe, at once he goes in with his sickle, because the harvest has come. He also said, with what can we compare the kingdom of God, or what parable will we use for it? It is like a mustard seed, which when sown upon the ground is the smallest of all the seeds on earth, Yet when it is sown, it grows up and becomes the greatest of all shrubs and puts forth large branches so that the birds of the air can make nests in its shade. With many such parables, Jesus spoke the word to them as they were able to hear it. He did not speak to them except in parables, but he explained everything in private to his disciples. This is the gospel of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Much of our lives is lived being bombarded by the need to make choices. 
what to eat, what not to eat, what to watch on TV, what not to watch, perhaps what type of car I should buy, which organisations to belong to or to financially support. Then again, how much time do I give to the things of God? Or do I hedge my options and keep part of my life outside the norms of the kingdom of God? It's said that we have in our handbag or wallet what can basically tell a lot about us as a person. In fact, many of the choices I mentioned just now will be evidenced by what we carry about our person. We make choices and we live by them. In Jesus' parable of the weeds, he is challenging his listeners about their choices. One may ask, what do you carry about your spiritual person, which is of the kingdom of God? If we're honest, we might well know that our lives are indeed a contradiction. Paul, in his letter to the Romans, points this out. He's not talking in parables, but directly. He's urging them to redefine how they think about life. Who or what determines their standards? Is it the flesh? Or is it the spirit? It would be tempting to think that that was for them, for the Romans, but not for us. Wrong. This is God's word for today, and we ignore it at our peril. Paul is asking the Christians in Rome and us to take a look at our attitudes. How do we think about life? How do we identify our social obligations? How do we as Christians interact with society? What determines our standards? Is it the flesh or is it the spirit? Do we subscribe to this world or to the kingdom of God? Turning back to the parable of the weeds, Jesus is teaching about the kingdom where God reigns. Jesus, by his coming and living amongst us on earth, represents the breaking in of God's kingdom on earth. As such, it's a direct clash with the political leaders of his time, and perhaps may be considered to be a direct challenge to our political leaders. Certainly when one looks at the speeches given in the House of Lords by our bishops, and how these are often disregarded, poo-pooed, trivialised. They are speaking the word of God as they understand it. And we should be praying for them. The gospel is de facto a political document. It's an alternative understanding of the world one which is not at all popular with those in authority. And Jesus is saying to all, there is a choice of allegiance to be made to God or to the emperor. Having to make such a choice is potentially divisive. One commentator has observed that the divisive impact of God's empire is central to the 13th chapter of Matthew's Gospel. Divisive because it's one thing or the other. You cannot sit on the fence. The parable of the weeds could be seen as an advertisement for the kingdom of God and it is articulated very well in verses 24 and 25 where we read He put before them another parable the kingdom of heaven may be compared to someone who sowed good seed in his field. But while everyone was asleep, an enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat 
and then went away. Straight away the crowd is alerted to the fact that there is a serious opposition to God's kingdom. There is an enemy who seeks to exact harm. Both our readings today, from Matthew chapter 13 and from Paul's letter to the Romans chapter 8, speak of the same issue. For Paul it is either the flesh or the spirit. For Jesus in Matthew's Gospel it is either the kingdom of God or the empire of man. This amounts to the same thing and creates a dichotomy, a contradiction. We must be wary of this situation in our own lives and not fall into the trap of distilling everything in our world into two realms, realms which we create. For in so doing we are likely to be planting weeds in the harvest field. Weeds such as us versus them, good versus evil, believer versus non-believer. A classic um, current societal ex example perhaps would be the USA's political system. Are you Democrat or are you Republican? Hard lines drawn, even battle lines, fanned by the winds of popularism. For us in the Anglican Church, we are not immune. Liberals versus conservatives, evangelicals versus traditionalists. We are right and they have it all wrong. This tendency to divide the world into two has to be avoided. If we do this, we're doing the enemy's work for him. Jesus teaches a solution when he is speaking with the disciples in the upper room. This is towards the end of his earthly ministry. And we read in John chapter 13. I, that's Jesus, give you a commandment. A new commandment. That you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you also should love one another. By this everyone will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. David Winter, the author and broadcaster, made the following comment about this passage. They, the disciples, must learn to love each other, because only then would they be able to fulfil Jesus' mission for them in his absence. He goes on to say, it was true then and it's true now, that the most attractive thing about the Christian church is the love its members show to each other, and conversely, that the most unattractive thing about the church is when they don't. You see, we're all together in this, whether you identify with the planet, our country, our local community, or our worshipping community. It matters in each of those identification areas. And in closing, let us remember that the harvest belongs to the Son of Man. We are the fruits of Christ's labour, and to recognise that our actions and choices have consequences. As you sow, so shall you reap, says the writer to the Galatians. If your spiritual wallet or handbag contains a licence issued by the Kingdom of God, then remember to live peaceably and with compassion towards all. Remembering that we are heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. Amen.